make our way through various sections of scripture in Isaiah with different themes surrounding the Christmas season, the Advent season, and today we'll be in Isaiah chapter 12. And I hear that Angel preached Isaiah chapter 12 as well yesterday, so Cindy, you'll be the judge of who preaches a better sermon. No, I'm just joking. Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. The word of the living God, dear church. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. That will preach. Let's ask the Lord for that end. Lord, this scripture is packed to the brim with rich, glorious truths, Lord, that should rise up all to the glory of you, our God. And Lord, for that to happen, for preaching to have any potency, we need the Spirit of God, your Spirit, Lord, to come and bless the sermon. We need, Lord, true unction and anointing from on high. So, Lord, I pray that you would achieve your ends to the means that you have decreed to accomplish those ends, which is the foolishness of preaching and preaching of the cross of Christ. So, Lord, I pray, I pray for us this morning that we, like child, with childlike faith, would truly hear the word of you, our Father. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Sometimes I tell people that I grew up basically in Mexico, just in the United States. I feel like my home was a very Mexican home, and I didn't know a lot of the common things. Uh, you know, even though I had older siblings, they were off doing older sibling things. So I feel like I was honestly growing up in a little Mexico, just in the United States. So much so that in first grade, I was handed a sheet of Christmas music, and all these kids around me are singing all these Christmas songs, and I'm like, how do they know all these songs? We just were handed the sheet. They were singing Frosty the Snowman and, uh, you know, Jingle All the Way or whatever. They knew all the songs. All these kids knew all the songs. And I was honestly very impressed. They loved it. And I loved hearing them sing. I thought it was something so unique that all these kids knew these songs. And there, though I did not know it, I was seeing the benefits of good tradition. All these kids knew something about these songs. And it was passed down from the generations before them. And since that time... Christmas has always had been, it's truly been my favorite time of the year. But it wasn't the lights, it wasn't, uh, you know, the movies or the gifts. It was honestly that time when I heard all those little kids singing all these Christmas songs. There was something unique happening when I'm listening to so many little voices sing the same songs and they seem joyful, they, they're, they're truly excited. It was the songs that really gripped my heart. Now, I, now you could flash forward some years and I'm a Christian now, and now I'm hearing Christian Christmas songs. And then now the, 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 the lid is just completely off. I, I'm, I'm fully bought in to the true joy that there is in the Christmas season, especially for us as Christians as we're celebrating the incarnation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there are songs to reminisce that reality. There are songs to remember that goodness. In fact, carols themselves, Christmas carols, they're so potent because they're, they're written in a certain uh, uh, melodic form that are meant to be catchy. Uh, it's, it's meant to be something that, that breathes familiarity in us to a time of days gone by. It's a, it's a built-in nostalgia, you can say. In fact, I know that when you hear Christmas music in, in June, you might think, oh, it feels weird, it's June, because you're kind of almost transported back to the winter. It's like you're, you're, you're having this little out-of-body experience. And this is the way that music works. This is the way that singing works. In fact, if I were to put on certain songs from an era which you grew up in, you go there. I mean, you can smell the air. I mean, when, when I hear songs from when I was in third grade, I could smell the pizza from the cafeteria room. I could smell the book fair as I'm walking through uh, elementary school. That's the way that music works. It, it, it transports you. It makes you feel like you're almost truly at the time when you first heard that song or when you first developed a memory tied to that music. And why is this so? Is it just because it, it, um, it just happens to be this way? No, 
It's because this is how God has truly ordained this world to work. This is how God has governed this world. You know, sometimes we just think that things happen a certain way because it just is the way it is. That's what we would call enlightenment thinking. That's you, uh, based on your rationale, your experience, it's just how it works for you. And I'm saying, no, that is not true. What is true is music itself, in the order and the design of God, is doing something to us. It's breeding something in us. That's why all of humanity, even if you go to the most remo uh, remote parts of the world where Christianity and, and the worldview of Christianity has not gone, why are there chants worshiping some higher power in these remote areas? And why, if you, if you go to these areas, why is there always a, a, a little drum beat that people are, are moving to? In fact, if I were to play some music and it had a nice little drum beat, you would move with it too. It's something innate in us. It's God's design. It's God's world. And this is how God uses music. This is how God uses singing. So even the songs of Christmas are doing something to you. They're taking you to a past and reminding you of a future. This is the way that music works. And if someone does not like music in this room, that's just an effect of the fall. <laughs> it's just how they're impacted by the fall. It's not our preference. It's not our rationale, our conviction. No, this is how God has designed the world. And I pray that we see this morning from his word that singing is so central to God accomplishing his ends. Singing is so central to Christianity. Christians are a singing people. Or we should be a singing people. Christians should be the loudest ones joyfully worshiping our God. But even Christians have bought into the lie that music is something that we witness happen rather than something that we participate as a church. So when I hear that some Christians aren't big on singing or when I know that some people in the congregation don't want to sing because they don't sing well, it's a part of me wants you know, to be no, come sing with us. Come sing with us. It's God's plan. But another part of me that's a little more sympathetic realizes it's just because that's what Christianity has done to you. The, the, the lights are down. The music is jacked all the way up. So that way you're just focusing on that or you and the Lord. And, it, and you're, you've been taught to not sing. You've been taught to witness singing. Or you've been taught that your voice, uh, if it's not perfect, shouldn't be raised up to the Lord. Because when the speakers are all the way up and we can't hear each other, you're being taught, hey, it's kind of embarrassing. I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of exposed here. So really, even Christians are losing sight of the potency of, of singing and the importance of singing in the congregation in our homes. God's world, God's design has certain elements in it that don't just work. No, it's built into the fabric of our world that music and singing are potent. That music and singing are part of God's creation and they should be very vital to Christians as well. And that's what I say. That's why we feel what we feel during the Christmas season. That's why you have a sense of enchantment, a sense of, 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 of magic happens when you hear the Christmas songs that you grew up listening to. I mean, you hear, you know, some of these classics come on, and it's a beautiful, you know, cold evening, and the lights are on, and the kids have hot cocoa. I mean, something's happening with, uh, inside of you. And if not, you're just a Scrooge, honestly, because you're not enjoying the goodness of God in these little elements. And so what I want to see is what's happening at Christmas with the songs of Christmas, I'm saying, for Christians, that needs to be every Lord's Day. That needs to be constant in our life. And I'll, try, I'll seek to show this to us in the sermon that we'll be hearing today. Christian music should teleport us. And it does, church. When we see the doxology, what do we say? Praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? And then we say, praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Do you realize in the doxology, you're telling angels to come sing with you. And guess what? They come sing with you. The heavenly host join our little church here, and they sing, and they praise God with us. So music actually does, singing actually does transcend the physical realm. There is a real teleportation, you could call it that, happening when Christians are singing together. And singing ultimately is preparing us for what we'll be doing in glory. What are you going to do in heaven? Sing. If you don't enjoy singing here, you're going to do a lot of singing up there for a lot longer time. So what I'm saying is, 
Christmas is a small taste of the potency of music and singing for the Christian life. And I want us to take Christmas and expand what we feel here to all of Christian music, to all of Christian singing. And not this corny stuff that you're hearing out there that are put, that's put on the radio. I don't want the corny stuff. I want the rich, deep theology. And I want the good Christian, uh, even the modern guys who are making better music. And this is why I'll never understand why so much of Christian contemporary, contemporary music is so terrible when Christians above all others should be making the best music. Why is not? Because we're the ones who are in tune with the God who created music. We're the ones who know the ultimate purpose of music and singing. Christians should be the best creators of music because they reflect their creator God in making music. So Brad, get on it. No, I'm just joking, bro. But seriously, it, it should be the case that Christians should be producing the best music. And Christian churches should be singing the loudest, the most joyful. I haven't even preached verse 1 yet, so let me just get into it now. All this is application, by the way. Um, so I might say at some point, and so for application, but all this is going to be application because it just is one of those sermons. Look at verse, verse 1. You will say in that day, that same reality, in that day, in that day. We've been hearing this over and over from Isaiah because, remember, he's contrasting in his day and in that day. In his day, it's dark. In that day, there will be light. In his day, there's no good king. In that day, there's coming a king. In that day, it's the same reality, the, the reality of the coming of Christ. In that day, what will we say? I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, you turned away. Your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. That day, the day we've been mentioning over and over again, is when God, who was angry with sinners, will now save them. For God, who was angry with his people, sent his, out of his love, sent a people, sent a, a Savior to save his people, so that from anger, now there's comfort. From wrath, now there's ra uh, grace and mercy. He sent a deliverer to truly take our wrath in our place. He sent Jesus Christ. In that day, he sent Christ that his anger might be turned into comfort and love. It's the gospel. It's all it is. We respond to God's grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ by praising him. Look at verse 2. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. It's very, very simple. If we sing of God's saving work, if we sing of God's salvation, and God is our salvation, then therefore God is our song. When, when we sing songs that are talking about the glorious redemption of, of us in Christ, we're singing God as our song because God is the one who accomplished that end. So God is our song. Christ is our song. And we sing all these songs by the power of the Spirit. We sing of what he's done for us. This is why we say God truly inhabits the praises of his people. Because we're just singing about what God has done for us. So again, when you listen to Christian music, ask yourself, what's this song about? Is it about what God has done? Or is it about me and how great I am and, and what I need? It really comes down to this. Is your Christian music God-centered or man-centered? Is your Christian worship God-centered or man set because what I see is God is our song. Most Christian music today would be man is our song. Church, may we be a people and a, and a church who loves to sing about what God has done for us because he is our strength. He is our salvation. He is truly our song. We worship, again, we don't need to worship there on the mountain, there in the temple. No, we worship here and God inhabits the praises of our worship. And all this should be done with grumpy faces, with, you know, I take, the, I take the worship of God so serious. This is just so reverent right now. No, look at verse 3. With joy, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. I love this with joy. We just keep pulling out more water, more water, more water from the endless well of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is inexhaustible. We cannot keep, we cannot run that well dry. And so Christian people should not be a dry people. 
We have living water that we keep pulling out and pulling out and pulling out, and we do so with joy, with happiness, with a sense of, of, of liveliness about it. And precisely as we with joy pull out the well, the water from the well, we show the world the greatness of our God. This is precisely how we make known to the world of his greatness, of his exalted name. In fact, when you go to a lot of the scriptures that talk about singing, there's a word that's used there that's talking about witness. It's how we witness. It's how we testify. It's how we witness. Church, if someone were to be walking down that street over there, they should be able to hear the praises of God's people and say, what are they singing about in there? And we should be able to, with our music, sing words that say about his greatness, about how good he is, about how amazing he is, with joy. In verse 5, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Same, same, same exhortation. We sing because he's done great and mighty things, and we let it be known in all the earth. Verse 6, shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion. I mean, this is as Christmas as it gets. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is our God. Precisely, it's Christ coming into our world, in our midst, tabernacling amongst us. And Isaiah says, shout and sing for joy. And Reformed people say, best I could do is a low whisper. Be I mean, best I could do is maybe, maybe I'll take my hands out of my pockets for a little bit. Maybe I'll hum along when Isaiah says, shout. And, I, and, and don't come and say, well, I, I'm worried that, you know, I, we, we might begin to look like, you know, those crazy loud churches out there. I, I, I see no qualification. Shout in a, in a way that is, you know, dignified. No, just let your praises be known. Truly just let it go. Sing it. And don't, tell me, don't worry if you're going to throw someone off. You should have such joy in your heart, such a, a, a true joy in your heart that it, it results in shouting, as it were. Loud symbols clanging together. Now, am I saying that we're going to let all that stuff become a, a distraction or we have to fabricate that? We have to manipulate you into doing that? Absolutely not. But out of the overflow and the, uh, the, the joy and the abundance of your heart, that should just come naturally. And it should just flow from us, us who would inhabit the true Zion, the heavenly city, us who are citizens of heaven, us who have, been, who have seen the goodness of God, us who can say that the long-awaited Savior, Messiah, King has come, us who know what the purpose of Christmas and all of life is about, Jesus Christ and his life and his death and his resurrection, us who can say we've tasted the goodness of, our, of God in our salvation, we're no longer headed to hell, we're now receiving all the inheritance, we're co with Christ. Us, especially Reformed people who say that we have the best grip on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Us who can tell you the doctrines of grace. Who, who can tell you the, the five points. And, and we, we, we know it all theoretically. Us who say that we have the best theology. Then why is our worship not flowing like that? If you're louder in debates than you are in worship, there's a problem with you. Your worship should be joyful, exuberant. It should be shouting if that's what the Lord is stirring up in your heart. And again, we don't go chasing these things. These things should be born in us freely and naturally. So if you're not naturally a shouter, don't just start next week shouting all of a sudden, but just sing. Whatever that shouting is reflecting of you, sing to that degree. Christ has come, church. He's given his life for us. He's rescued us from hell. I think more then a hum is deserved to that end. I think more than just a, you know, quiet little whisper is merited for what Christ has done. Great in our midst is the Holy One of Israel, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the Christ. This is why Christmas, for lack of a better word, smacks. Because it's the one time that Christians want to sing. It's the one time that Christians... Get out of the little shell and actually sing some songs. When that should be the case throughout all of our Christian experience, throughout all of life. So I thought for this sermon, the application is simple. 
But let me show you from Scripture just how God truly uses his people praising their king. And so I'm, I just did a bunch of you know, studying this week surrounding music, theology of music, the theology of praise, and how God uses it, and all, the, all throughout the narratives. And so I'm, I grabbed a bunch of stuff. Obviously, you know, every pastor truly knows nothing's unique to him. He's just standing on the shoulders of giants. So I have a bunch of things that I'm just going to go through, and I want you to see just how potent music is, just how potent praises is, as the word has revealed it to be the case. Cain is the, obviously killed his brother, and his family built a lot of cities. Cain actually took dominion after that event. And you see, numbered with the building of cities, God highlights that there was great musicians in the family line of Cain. So music itself is a form of taking dominion as Christians. In order for us to build instruments, we need to chop things down, form them in a certain way, and assemble them together so that they produce the sound that we want to hear. Is that not taking dominion? Is that not taking Christ to all of life? Even the, the, the instruments were sometimes shaped as bows that looked like you were going to stretch your arm out to shoot somebody. All done purposely to show even our music is a style of warfare. Why do you think that in the scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, whenever a king was coronated, there would be praises surrounding that coronation? Kings themselves wrote songs. Queens wrote songs. They're, they're all throughout the scripture, there's women singing praises when God does something great. There's a song of, 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 of Hannah. There's the, the, the song of Miriam. Even the song of Mary. Because our response to God is singing and praise. We see every time that God would do something in the Old Testament and there'd be this, this celebration, there'd always be praise that followed that. So music truly is, in a sense, one of the ways that we make war. One of the ways that we wage war against the darkness. When Saul was tormented by the evil spirit, what weapons did David take to that demoniac spirit? Music. Music, and it fled. That was his instrument, that was his weapon of choice, was the 10-string larp. And that devil fled. Just to show you how God uses music and our, and our singing and praise to his advancement of his kingdom. In fact, when you see truly being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5 says that we are to be filled with the Spirit and then address one another with singing, with psalms and spiritual so songs. Why don't you sing to me when you come up to me? <laughs> Just joking, right? I mean, but in a real sense, when we come together, we're singing to one another. Yes, we're singing to God, but co uh, congregational singing is singing to one another as well. So what we need to see is that God uses music and singing and praise as a weapon of his kingdom to advance his kingdom against the enemy. This warfare is something that we need to take serious because our singing is part of God's design to advance his kingdom to wage war on the enemy. So again, if the application is not simple, if you want to be a big tough guy who, who's a warrior for Christ, then you better be singing. That's one of the ways that you make war against the enemy. All of this, all this reality of the reality that Christmas shows just how powerful singing and music is, how Christmas takes all of us to a different place, how Christmas has a sense of magic and enchantment. I'm saying that needs to be true for all of Christian life. What do I mean by that? Right now, when your children hear Christian, uh, Christmas music, they, they bubble up a little bit. In fact, you, your little inner child, does the same. And that is beautiful because it's showing the design of God in music and in singing. I'm saying, I want your kids, upon hearing, great is thy faithfulness, to have the same experience. I want your children, upon hearing Psalm 2, say, I remember when our church first learned Psalm 2. Whatever you feel, as it were, during the Christmas season, I'm saying we can have that same reality every Lord's Day, all, all seasons of life. When we put on that song and our kids say, I remember when we used to sing that song during family worship. The same traditions that are being formed in Christmas, I'm saying that could be true for Tuesday night family worship. It could be true in the middle of summer when it's dead hot outside and you're in the backyard having family worship out there. And then guess what? 
in 10 years when those songs are still being played in your heart, in your mind, in your, in your family's heart and mind, they'll be taken to the time when they remembered, I remember when my dad sang that song to us. The application is so simple. Our natural response to salvation is singing. So much so that God sings. God himself sings. Listen to this in Zephaniah. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, similar to what we're hearing in Isaiah, on that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let your hands not grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one. In fact, the King James says, a warrior who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. Listen to this. This is what God is doing. He will exult over you with loud singing. God's own response to salvation is he himself sings over the people that he has saved. God sings over you. God truly is worshiping what he has done over you. Again, that war language, it's the Lord is a warrior, a mighty one to save, to save and he sings. So we sing because God sings. God responds to salvation with singing. We need to respond to our salvation with singing. Redemption was accomplished. God celebrates. When we, when we sing about re redemption being accomplished, we need to celebrate. Church, God sings over us. God died for us so that our, sons, our, our, our tongues could worship him. In fact, when you read so much of the Old Testament, like I've been trying to show you, Nehemiah, upon finishing the city walls, and their city walls weren't just, you know, one cinder block. It was about, you know, 10 to 15 feet wide. Their walls were that wide. And Nehemiah basically says, get everybody out. Get all the musicians out here. Get, get everyone. We're throwing a party. And all the people are lined up on top of the city walls. Remember, they... They've just come back to, these, to this city, and they've built the walls. And what is, Nehemiah, uh, what, what is Nehemiah's response? Get on the top of those walls, and let's celebrate. Nehemiah looks at the large wall. There's people marching up and down with the large choir made up of men, women, and children. They're all singing. They're all playing cymbals and harps and lyres, and they're offering a great sacrifice to God on that day. And this is what Nehemiah says at the end of this section. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Is that what our worship is like? I mean, sometimes I purposely leave the front door open at our house during family worship so that in case anyone's walking by, someone out here might hear a family singing together and singing Christian songs together. This is how we wage war. This is how we conquer. This is how we celebrate after we've conquered to be truly filled with zeal and singing. Why? Because Christ is king. Christ is king. And I love singing because it's one of the times where we are truly in unity together, except when Rick comes in five, five seconds early on every song. No, right? But there's a true unity about that. And I, I love all those little mess-ups because it's showing us we're still learning how to be in unison together. I mean, in music, you're literally saying one voice, one people, one heart. Music itself, singing, congregational singing itself is a sign of unity to the king, all trying to serve him together in one voice. So that in life, when there's differences, we could say, well, we sing together. We're in unison there. We have unity there. This is why congregational singing is so powerful, because no one's doing a solo up here. It's not about anyone up here. It's about us as a people of God with one voice praising our king together so that they may hear far away, so that they may truly know the joy of God out there because they see the joy of God celebrated in here. So let me keep it absolutely simple. Heaven is worshiping. God is singing. Nature is singing. Are you singing? Dads, do you sing to your children? I have a terrible voice, and most of you guys know that. And I don't let that stop me from singing. I try to back up away from the mic to not mess you guys up. But the point is, I don't care what I sound like. I care. Am I reflecting God's love for his children? If I want to be a father like God is a father, I need to sing over my children. This is not about me, but I'm just telling you ways that I practice that. Sometimes, my kids are little. I know some of you guys have older kids, so you might not do this. But I'll 
lay with them, and I'll sing a song in their ear. I'll sing a hymn in their ear. And I just pray that as they grow up, they remember every time they hear that song, my dad sang that song to me. There's times after I prayed for the children, I prayed for all of them, I leave the room, and Isabella goes in. She has a much better voice than I do. And I can hear her singing songs to our children from the other room. I mean, you mean to tell me that our children won't grow up remembering those songs as a sign, as a testimony, and a witness of God's love for them, God's care for them. It's all built around singing. Why is it that you could lose someone? You could, someone can die in your life, and you're going okay in your life. And then six months later, you hear a song, and you just feel the weight of that death again. Because that's the reality of the grip that song and music has upon us, because that's how God has created music to work, the good and the bad. It'll take you to some dark places when you heard that other song you shouldn't have been listening to. So what I'm saying is, I want singing to be part of the rhythm of life that when we hear good Christian hymns, psalms, and melodies, it fills all of our hearts with joy, with enchantment, to the point where our kids will remember the joy of singing with their Christian family, the joy of singing with their family at family worship. Maybe you don't feel like singing. Read the Psalms. That's precisely when you need to sing. Maybe you're too sad to sing. Even more so is when you need to sing. Some of the best moments that I've had when life has just come crashing upon me is like the psalmist when I just let it all out singing. When I just truly praise the Lord for who he is. Every detail of life, when we bring the beauty of praise to God in those areas, you'll see God truly begin to advance in those areas. So, it's simple. Sing. Sing. Sing because God sings. Sing because God is singing over what he's accomplished. Sing because the angels sing for what God has done. Sing because all of nature, all of creation is singing. Sing because God is in our midst. Sing because that Christmas he showed us how committed he was to this earth and to his people. Sing. Sing for the sake of your Christian family. Sing for the, sing for the sake of the legacy that you'll leave in, in days that are to come. Sing. Our children need to hear you sing. Our families need to hear you sing. Our culture needs to hear us sing. It's potent. It's God's weapon of choice. When he goes into battle, they're singing. When he finished battle, they're singing. Music shapes culture. You don't believe me? Look at everyone that likes rock music. They all look like rockers. Look at everyone who likes hip hop. They all dress like they're trying to be some thug or something. Music shapes cultures. Will music shape the culture of our church? It will, in one degree or another. May it truly be a Christ-centered singing that we have that has shaped the culture of our church to be a Christ-centered, joyful reality. So men, you need to sing. I don't care if you have a bad voice. You need to sing. Women, you need to sing. I don't care if you have a bad voice. You need to sing. Children, you need to sing as well. You need to sing of what God has done. Singing will train your little hearts to know what God has done for you. Married couples, sing together. I mean, on your way to somewhere, talk to each other and sing together. Husbands, sing with your wives. Sing to your wives. I don't care what it looks like. Singing is so dynamic to the Christian life. It should be so common to hear people singing in the Christian faith. God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we sing, we could say God is there with us. This better be the loudest doxology I've ever heard us sing, church. After all this exhortation, we better sing. I pray that we truly become a singing people because singing is warfare. Singing is the joy of our salvation made audible. Singing is God's tool to tell the goodness that people the far off might hear what God has done through the praises of what he's doing in and through us, even here at our church. So let's sing, church. Let's truly sing. <laughs>